So we're discussing from the uh, 16th century text, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is a text written primarily in Bengali, and it's written in a certain type of Bengali that's called Sadhu Bhasha. So, Bhasha means language, and Sadhu means saints. So, it's a version, an old version, like Old English. If you spoke it to the person in Bengal today, they probably wouldn't understand what you're saying any more than we would by the these and thous and so forth of, uh, of Old English. But it's, as, as such, Sadhu Bhasha, because the kind of the main language of the sadhus of India was Sanskrit, the sadhu bhasha of Bengali is full of Sanskrit words. And about 10% of, this, of the book itself, which is a narrative primarily, um, involves the citing of various Sanskrit verses from different texts like the Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, and so on and so forth. These texts are cited to support points that have been made in the, uh, in the narrative. The narrative is the life of Sri Chaitanya, who is a famous uh, spiritual reformer of the 15th century in Bengal, at the time in India when there was a great uh, kind of revolution of sorts amongst the people, in general religious people, inasmuch as the Advaitans and the Smartas certain religious group had kind of a monopoly on what constituted union with God and liberation and their teaching involved things like the idea that in order to attain union with the Godhead one had to take birth as a Brahmin hmm, in a certain caste and in that life become a, a renunciate uh, a sannyasin and, uh, a, uh, a, um, an ascetic walk into the Himalayas and so on and so forth. So this created some distance between God, if you will, theoretically, and ourselves. A distance that people felt was artificial. And so to meet that sensibility, so to speak, there were many reformers of the time who advocated the idea that that humans from all castes, creeds, whatever, uh, can, could have union with the God had simply through the medium of the divine logos or the name. So you have Kabir, you have this um, Guru Nanak, uh, uh, Tukaram is another, um, uh, and among them Sri Chaitanya, probably the most um, celebrated, and all of them advocating that this uh, invoking of the Logos or the divine name, something that is, I think, held sacred throughout the um, religious world, and I mean, I mean, say in different religious traditions, it's thought that the that in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was one, for example, you have in the Bible, in the Jewish tradition, they hold that the, the names of God are so sacred that no one can utter them. In the Islamic faith, they have, I think, 99 names of God that they chant on their beads, like a rosary, and so forth. And similarly in Hinduism. So there's a, this is universal amongst, I believe, the different religious texts. Buddhism also has some place for that. The, for example, the, the chanting of the name of the Amitabha Buddha is, is, uh, is thought to be uh, um, efficacious in terms of bringing one into the realm of uh, Buddhahood very um, naturally, more readily, easily, so to speak. Um, and of course, secularly speaking, uh, we also are coming to know as time goes on, there is great power in, uh, in sound. I recently saw an invention from Harvard University that um, uh, through sound, Put out fire. They st- st- took, put some oil down and you know, started a fire and put the machine and made a sound no one could hear, and the fire went out. 
So uh, it's like we manipulate fire and turn it into electrical energy, and we are talking on cell phones, computers, and so on and so forth. So the manipulation of water we're familiar with uh, to some extent. Here, for example, we manipulate the water, uh, not the best word, but we, we work with the water to create electricity through a microhydro system from the, from the river, hmm? and also from the sun, the solar panels. Um, but sound, then the art, if you will, or the science, the technology of working with sound is something um, that the uh, technological world hasn't developed as well. Here we're talking, of course, about sacred sound, but sound has power. What's in a name is sometimes asked, and there's quite a bit there. If you uh, if you you come home and your daughter says, somebody called on the phone, you say, well, did you get his name? Because if you get his name, then you can, oh, you can find him and so forth. I've given an example also that in most of the industrialized countries, now people have more of a number than a name. Hmm? A so social security number is in the United States, and here they call it a cedula number. I don't know what it's called in London, but they probably got one too in Britain. And if you know that, you can steal a whole person's identity. It's possible. You can take their whole bank account, their whole life, and so forth. So just an example of um, the power, if you will, in the name. And here we're talking about sacred, sacred sound. Hmm. That's an interesting idea in itself. Um, it's it's thought by some that that the um, world arises out of, out of mathematics, which are not a human construct but discovered by humans. There's a debate in the mathematical circles whether mathematics is invented by humans to describe the world or whether they're discovering circles and triangles and, and the uh, 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 mathematical equations that describe quarks and gluons and electrons and so on and so forth. Everything has sound attached to it, even in the electron, the movements, in the atom, the movements have sound connected with them and so forth. There's the string theory, you know, theory in science, that at the bottom of everything is vibrations. Hmm. The Hindus had this idea. Hmm. So the mantras were like, like mathematical equations, so to speak, right? that by invoking them, you could manifest world we thought is thought to be manifest out of sound hmm. so so sacred sound hmm. and and this particular narrative of Sri Chaitanya is about the life of Sri Chaitanya who is thought to be in the, the avatar of Krishna and Radha Radha and Krishna combined hmm, into one there's a dia to the divinity in our tradition is, is too. It has a, 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 so to speak, I mean, transcendence is, is, is beyond gender, but we have to use language described. So a male and female counter whole, if you will, to Radha and Krishna. And we've been talking a little bit about that because it's central to this book, given that the idea here is that Chaitanya, who appeared about 500 years ago, um, was the avatar of Krishna pursuing Radha's uh, devotion to him, pursuing her perspective on him. Hmm? He realized that this, this is a very interesting idea because it talks about the kind of an inner life of emotional life of the Godhead. Hmm? We think that we have a life, and God is maybe there. <laughs> but the, the God that would have life um, uh, in in some detail and so forth. It's an interesting concept, but um, introspective, exploring the God and exploring itself from the from the vantage point of, of Radha, realizing she sees something in him. She represents bhakti devotion. So the point is, 
that by bhakti, by devotion, by love, one can know everything. It said, if you love someone, they'll tell you all their secrets. It's true. It's an easy way of knowing. So, Krishna is being loved by Radha, and he thinks, she knows more than I do, actually. She loves me, but by loving me, you can see things in me that otherwise you cannot. I would like to see myself through her eyes. So Krishna is thought to descend in the world in the form of a devotee of himself in pursuing the perspective of, of Radha. And in doing so, he sets an example of how to be a devotee. And his practice, the method to his madness, is invoking the names of Krishna. The song we just sang, Yasumati Nandan, Rajabharanad. These are all different names of Krishna. Speaking of Krishna in divine play, in Leela, with his different uh, devotees in a, in, a, in a meditative world, hmm, beyond psychic and physical matter, if you will. So we were talking a little bit about this because it's central to the narrative, and we're just in the point of the narrative of the life of Sri Chaitanya, uh, where the author here, Krishna Skabharaj, is giving us a summary of the part of the story that, uh, well, the beginning of the story, where he is thought to appear in the world. So he's described his family, the family he appeared in, his elders, and so forth. The person who would play the role of his, his guru has been mentioned. But, but prior to his actual uh, appearance, this introspection on the part of Krishna that I just referred to in transcendence is kind of the esoteric reason for his appearance. Now, while there's an esoteric reason, an internal reason, Krishna wants to, God wants to explore himself. It's a kind of a uh, Whiteheadian, you know, idea, mm-hmm. Alfred North White, where, where God is like exploring himself and, and, and is everything but becoming more at the same time, something like that. So, um, so this introspection is kind of a, a existential crisis for God. It's a very extraordinary idea. Is is the, the, the internal reasons and background behind what's thought the appearance of Sri Chaitanya. So this has been mentioned. And now we come to the secondary reason for his appearance. So Krishna has done a very nice here because uh, he's giving a synopsis of this part of the story before he actually launches into it and at the very onset of it if you understand the text well he has spoken about the internal and the external reasons behind the advent of the Chaitanya avatar hmm? we heard and this is in a kind of a in a synopsis or in a, in a cryptic form hmm? it will be played out more in the Leela and it was also discussed at some length in the, in the preface to the book, hmm? the auspicious invocation. So, the external reason. And then he says what? Prabhuravyu bhav pube jata vishna bhagan advaita chajir stane korena gaman. Prabhuravyu bhav pube jata vishna bhagan. So, previously, previous to his appearance, then so many uh, devotees, he says, they used to gather Advaita Chajasthani Korena Gaman at the house of Advaita. So the person of Advaita is introduced. Advaita means non-different, non-dual. But here we find that Advaita is not a non-dualist in the monistic sense of Shankar's Advaita Vada, that's a very popular um, idea, um, form of Vedanta, but um, he's non-dual in the sense that he is thought also to be a manifestation of the Godhead. So we have Krishna, thought to be the fountainhead of divinity, 
So the very heart, the romantic heart of the divinity, just like you have Buddha, he's like the head of the divinity. Hmm? Christ like the like the sacrificial manifestation of divinity. So you could go on and on to cross culturally or within India, different gods and goddesses and so forth. If we look carefully, we see they're representing different aspects of divinity, and Krishna represents kind of the romantic heart of the Godhead, in love with Radha. He's kind of a hopeless character of sorts, hmm? uh, in, in terms of being overwhelmed by bhakti, kind of purchased by bhakti, by his devotees and so forth. Charming. Um, but definitely the heart of divinity. And so the heart is thought from an anatomical or biological point of view, obviously, to be the center. The brain could be dead, but if the heart's still beating, then there's a question of whether you should unplug the uh, whatever is keeping life. life support, right? Mm-hmm. So the heart of divinity. Krishna is depicted in literature and in aura and in drama as only playing. Mm-hmm. You have different gods and goddesses. Shiva's in meditation, dressed in ashes in the Himalayas. Brahma has four heads. He's the manager. Mm-hmm. Um, so the gods or goddesses, we study this whole uh, pantheon of gods and goddesses in Hindus. In Hinduism, we see they represent certain emotional and practical aspects of the, of the divinity. Just like you have gods for rain, gods for the sun, goddesses for the um, whatever, for the wind, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's a very worshipful culture. The whole yoga culture is very worshipful. You know, you have your Surya Namaskar, where in the morning you give your respect to the sun and so forth. The idea, the philosophical underlying idea behind this is that behind nature, there is consciousness. Nature, matter, is insentient, inert, and it re- requires the, the, the touch, if you will, of consciousness to be in, in, in motion. Consciousness gives kind of meaning to matter. Without consciousness, what would matter? So, the whole idea in Hinduism of the veneration of the gods and goddesses is is really kind of a beginning um, expression of kind of an infantile, but beginning, um, I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but uh, expression of love in the form of gratitude. In other words, we have eyes by which we see, but without sun, our eyes cannot see. So we're dependent on the macrocosm in nature for the microcosm of our self, which is made of the same stuff, same elements, to be proficient in whatever we may want to do. So we should live with gratitude, is the idea. I've given an example before that if you live in a house, and you flip a switch, you get light, you turn a valve, you get water, you maybe press a button, you get heat. If you go to the mailbox, you get a bill. It means there's somebody on the other end. You have to recognize them and pay the bill, or you won't get light when you turn the switch, or you won't get water when you turn the valve, and so forth. So, uh, in a larger sense, it's thought that the abundance and the bounty of nature um, is such that it proceeds, if you will, or um, um, it, it, it responds, nature responds, to a loving approach. So, as I said, if you love someone, they'll tell you all the secrets. The real secret of nature is that it has a soul, it's us. That's a secret. That there's something beyond matter, and it's us. So, that, of course, we have to turn um, inward hmm? in an exercise and a spiritual practice that builds upon the basic uh, gratitude that I was talking about. Hmm? So, here, introduced into the text, is Advaita, the personality. He is thought in the Leela of Chaitanya hmm, to represent the aspect of Krishna called Vishnu who is thought to like preside over over matter something like that the idea is something like 
within the spiritual dimension, there are many liberated souls who attained mukti. And the god at Vishnu has a desire to experience compassion. So God is the reservoir of love. God wants to experience compassion. It's not something that happens in time, but we have to use language and what limits of that to talk about. So once upon a time, he desired to taste compassion. Now, how can he have compassion in a world where everyone's liberated? There is no one to bestow liberation upon, salvation upon, and so forth. So just the very up spring out of, uh, upsurge of desire to taste compassion causes the world of our present experience to manifest. And then a form of, of Vishnu, hmm, we call the Mahavishnu, is thought. So he is thought to be like the embodiment of compassion in Hinduism. The Mahavishnu. And the representation of that divinity is thought to be in the Leela of Chaitanya, in the person of Advaita. So, Advaita, a divine figure in the uh, in the narrative, before the avatar of Chaitanya, is said to be the person at whose house there were regular meetings and chanting of the names of God and so on and so forth. And it says, Gita Bhagavata Kahe Acharya Gosai Gyan Karm Nindi Kore Bhakti Rabadai Sarva Shastri Kahe Krishna Bhakti Rabhyakyan Gyan Yog Tapo Dharma Nahi Manayan So it's said here that he he used to explain the Gita Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam from a devotional perspective. There are different perspectives that you could draw from from these texts and so forth. There are schools, for example, of yoga that seek a transcendence in a particular way, schools of, of jnana, of knowledge, um, that seek tr- a particular aspect of transcendence. Um, there are schools of the karma marg that seek, don't seek transcendence, but material acquisition. We start can start there, the, the path of material acquisition, we perform religious acts or whatnot in order to get things hmm, to improve our material condition. It's kind of a low end, because we're not things. <laughs> so, the things acquiring things is is not going to improve our life. It said the best things in life are not things. So that's knowledge from the uh, uh, Hindu perspective of Vedanta. Real knowledge is that we are all in pursuit of enduring happiness and we will not get it in relation to things that don't endure. Indeed, our attachment to things that don't endure is the womb from which suffering is born. Because we're attached to things that we can't keep and so when they're gone, we lament. And that's what death is. It's, it's a problem because of attachment. Without attachment, it's not a problem. But we can't have a ta- detachment unto itself. So the detachment, bhairagya, corresponds with jnana. Jnana means the ingress of spiritual wisdom in which one begins to experience the atma, the self, the unit of consciousness that we are. Hmm? Instead of trying to be pleasured or to get security or to be virtuous, we find we are a unit of bliss. We are a unit of knowing. We are a unit of being. Hmm? It has no beginning, has no end, and so forth. So this is obviously a very profound experience. And as this ingress of wisdom through genuine spiritual practices um, starts to manifest the conventional ego that I am British, I'm Indian, I'm Italian, I'm American, Central American, North American, starts to dissipate. Hmm? And the bigger self, so to speak, small but big, big and generous, big big and broad-minded, if you will. Hmm? So, 
from the karma path, where we try to get things, to the path of knowledge, karma means action, from the path of action to the path of knowledge, where we try to get away from things, we, we overcome our attachments, we let go of things, hmm? and find that we are more than the things. Hmm? We are building a life based on things and an identity based on their acquisition. We began to be defined by them, in fact. Hmm? I am American, I am male, I am rich, I am poor, I am this or that. This is all based on attachments and desires, hmm? all of which is transient, all those things can change. So that identity is not an enduring one. So for, and again, from, you know, from that identity to an identity based on knowledge of the self, the inner self. Hmm? That, then getting away from things, letting go, is this particular path that leads to transcendence in the form of kind of loving to exist, the bliss of existing, the bliss of knowing that I exist with no beginning and no end. In other words, my existence isn't threatened anymore. I'm not under the threat of non-existence. I don't have to struggle with other living beings to survive. I am. Hmm? And it's blissful to be and to know that I be or that I exist to the extent that I do. It's a huge relief, if you will. But here what's being discussed is that what Advaita was talking about from the Gita and other texts was not a path that of material acquisition, neither a path of, of knowledge by which I could love to exist, but a path that ended up in existing to love. Hmm? To love to exist is one thing, to exist to love is another thing. To love to exist is kind of a passive existence. So we move from the movements of material life where we're not really loving to exist that much. Hmm? because we're hunting and we're being hunted also. Here one living being is, is food for another, no matter how you arrange it. <laughs> that's just an unfortunate fact. Hmm. So that struggle, Darwinian struggle for existence. Hmm. To overcome that kind of movement and come to peace, but and be and know, but understand that we have a purpose for loving, and we, that brings into the picture a significant transcendental other, if you will, the Godhead. You can love to exist because you know I am forever and I don't have to take from anyone or anything and so forth. But then to interact with your source, hmm? capacity for loving will increase because love is really evaluated on a scale of reciprocation. So if you love to exist, that's one thing, but if there's no one to love, then the fact that I exist myself, there's no other, it's arguably a loving situation that could be improved upon hmm, in transcendence. So relative to the path one takes, a certain face of transcendence is going to be attained and experienced. So what Advaita is teaching here is the path of bhakti. Hmm, and he wants to teach about bhakti rasa to attain loving, divine union with the Absolute, to enter into the play of Krishna, if you will. You're out there. So, this is what he was teaching about. Here he says, Tanra Sange Ananda Kode Vaishnavergaan Krishna Kata, Krishna Puja Namsan Kirtan So, it describes a little bit of his method. He says, In the house of Dvaita, all the devotees took pleasure always in talking about Krishna, in worshipping Krishna, in enchanting the names of Krishna and so forth, just like we do here. That's what they were doing. Hmm? Uh, if you love someone, then you sing about them, you talk about them and so forth. Uh, so, Kintu Sarva Loka Deki Krishna Bahir Muk Vishai Nimagna Lok Deki Paiduk So in all this you can imagine it was blissful. Hmm. They were singing and dancing, but chanting and discoursing all about an, a transcendental object, argu arguably our spiritual source. So the happiness derived from this 
and the attachment that might accrue is not like the attachment for things that are here today and gone tomorrow. <laughs> so it's an, it, it's not it's not problematic. It doesn't give give birth to to suffering, but to bliss. So this was their experience. They were chanting and they became deeply blissful. They were experiencing this the, the, the ananda, the bliss of the self, and so forth. And then bhakti ananda, the bliss of the self, interacting with the, with the Godhead. So this is they had no cares is the idea. But one care was surfacing in Advaita. So this is very curious. Hmm? Kintu, however, Sarvaloka Deki, Krishna, Bhajamuk, he says. Hmm. He felt pain nonetheless. Where was the pain? Hmm. He saw so many people in the world suffering based on their attachments. So this is the character of the uh, Vaishnav, this uh, Krishna devotee. It said, Paradukuti ki kripam buddhi. The, the Vaishnav has no sorrow for himself or herself, but he or she has a sorrow for the suffering of others. So, so, and this is an important point here, so central is compassion to the tradition. Hmm? We have a high theology, the idea of attaining union with the Godhead and so forth. Hmm? That is actually higher and above compassion, because compassion, as we already heard earlier, has to refer to persons in need. Liberated persons don't have any need. So this is the world where compassion has a place. It's manifest out of the desire of the Godhead to bestow compassion. Advaita is the personification of that compassion. Hmm? So here he's expressing the typical compassion of the Vaishnavas. So we have to be careful in our practice. We talk about things, high ideals and so forth, hmm? but we have to see that our heart is changing in such a way. We're actually becoming kind, compassionate, naturally, because there's to go to higher realms of love and transcendence, you cannot skip over this, this part. Um, and it's it's an important point to stress. I'll give you an example. One god brother of mine, I, I initiated by the same guru, he was sitting, standing with our guru on a balcony in Calcutta. And what part of India are you, your family from? Around Amrista. Amrista. Punjab. Mm-hmm. This was in, in West Bengal, but it happens in Punjab also. They looked over the balcony and there were some beggars there. And one person had only one hand hmm, to form. They had a begging cup and so forth. And they were begging on the street. So my god-sibling, so to speak, uh, he turned to our guru and he said, that, Guru Dev, he said, sometimes I actually feel sorry for those people. Hmm. Now, what his thinking was, as far as I can tell, is that that people are suffering in the world for a reason. And the reason is ignorance and ignorance of attachment and so on and so forth. It's, uh, it's also part of their reaping, part of what they've sown in terms of the principle of karma. So someone could be in a spiritual practice and, and, and actually become hard-hearted and think, well, all these people, that's their karma, too bad for them. Hmm? Um, and so forth. Um, so he was actually thinking, if I really want to help people, I should teach them about, give them transcendental knowledge, spiritual knowledge, and the fact that they're hungry or poor or something like that, that's a lesser thing. I shouldn't be concerned about that. Hmm? Because, after all, let's say, here's an example. If you a man is drowning and you go to save him and you just save his his shirt, come back with his shirt, that's not very useful. So the self is the atma, not the body. So if you save the body and you have not saved the self, what kind of relief have you engaged in? It's, it's limited. Hmm? Um, you can feed hungry people. That's good, but hunger will never go away like that. After a few minutes, it will come back. Hmm? 
Hunger is a problem, is a symptom of the disease of material attachment that causes us to have identification with matter and the needs that come from such identification. If you think you're made of matter, then you have a lot of needs to preserve. But if you're not, then you don't. So there's an argument that 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 we should not engage in a kind of uh, philanthropic and altruistic activities aimed at social reformation or feeding the poor, opening hospitals, but spend our valuable time only in trying to teach about um, a real solution to the entire problem rather than treat the symptoms, treat the problem. Rather than water the branches of the tree, water the root. Hmm? Now that's a, a, a good argument. However, the fact of the matter is if you're actually watering the root, hmm, your own heart is actually softening. And so deeper compassion will include within it a lesser forms of compassion. So while yes, a transcendentalist should be busy themselves on the path of tr spiritual pursuit, which would be good for them and others that they're involved with and so forth, if in the course of that they have the opportunity to help people on any other level, naturally they're disposed towards that as well. Hmm? So he was thinking, I shouldn't be thinking about helping them on, in their material condition because they're actually consciousness, not matter, and so on and so forth. So he said, you know, sometimes I guess I'm confused and I actually feel sorry for them. <laughs> and our guru said, why only sometimes? Hmm? So that was a real surprise for him. Why only sometimes? So we could see that he was deeply compassionate and always teaching about the need to make a permanent solution to the problem of suffering. But at the same time, he felt naturally compassionate for the suffering of people on all levels. Hmm? So, therefore, it said that the Vanchakal Patru Desha Kripa Sindhivyevacha. Patitanam Pabani Vaishnavi. It said that the Vaishnava is, is, is really composed, the devotee of, of compassion. So, if you want to taste Bhakti Rasa, for example, first you have to taste compassion. It has to come within you. This is part of the, what's called the cleansing of the heart, hmm? that will first be the, be the first effects of kirtan, of chanting, hmm? a softening of the heart. Hmm? Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, who was um, attracted to Vedanta, uh, Hinduism, and Buddhism, he came to the conclusion that the compassion is the basis of moral life. Hmm? He wrote a paper to this effect, refuting Kant's, um, what is Kant's thing? Um, um, Critique of Pure Reasoning was his book. Yep. It, it, anyway, um, The Moral Imperative, was it? Yeah, The Moral Imperative. Anyway, he, he, he wanted to replace The Moral Imperative and, and, and the application of reason to determine moral law with the will of loving compassion. He thought that this was the real basis of the moral life. Hmm? Um, Jesus in the New Testament said that we should love our neighbor as ourself. And that all the laws of the Old Testament were fulfilled in this law and loving the God with all your heart and soul. These are the two laws of the New Testament. So with regard to compassion, love your neighbor as yourself. In the Bhagavad Gita it is said, in the sixth chapter near the end, Krishna says, the perfect yogi is he or she who sees the sufferings of others as if they are his own. Hmm? So this compassion, what it really involves is, in the full sense of the term, is a stepping outside of oneself, the small egocentric self. Hmm? Um, stepping outside of oneself and standing on the ground of being. There's no, there there's no church or nation, team or tribe, hmm? no pride, no, no borderline. Hmm? And by contrast, the moral law 
unto itself. It lacks the vision hmm, of the self's capacity to love universally because it sees people in terms of all these differences. It sees people in terms of individuality, uh, 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 a uh, individualism, nationalism, speciesism, and so on and so forth, all of which are types of identities that can only thrive to one extent or another at the cost of another living being. Hmm? Now you have big problems with immigration all over the world. Hmm? And you, you see the problem, nationalism, it can be pretty ugly. Hmm? Right? Hmm? But it's hard you know, to get the, 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 there's arguments on both sides, and we can't let everybody in. And so, so you know, it, it, you push down here. It, as I say, often it comes up over here. Hmm? If you catch a, you try to free the fly from the spider's web, you just took away the spider's dinner. So how do you solve the problem? <laughs> so the idea is that 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 that. And that, that we have to rise above these, these identities, these material identities derived from identifying with matter. Mm -hmm. um, and as much as morality constitutes proper behavior in relation to, to others, if under the moral law, we invariably have to live to one extent or another at the cost of another, that's not a very nice way to behave. If my being is at the cost of another to one extent, or to some extent, which is an inevitable in, in material existence, then you can see it's a struggle for existence. It's not a place in which you can be completely virtuous. Hmm? That's the conclusion of a wise person. Hmm. Therefore, the idea is that compassion hmm, derives from another plane altogether, hmm, from transcendence. The, the, the ocean of compassion that the Mahavishnu is, we are a drop of that. So we have some capacity to be compassionate. The mystic experience of compassion that in which universal compassion arises within them hmm, is such that, that they're quite sure that compassion is not a misfiring of the brain or some strategy of matter evolving, something like that. Hmm. No. Hmm. And To define compassion as such, what the compassion is in the experience of the mystics is a, is a kind of an, a, 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 an, a, a surfacing of the sleeping self, the atma, from underneath the covers of matter. And these covers of matter are the various forms of life, biological forms of life. And the biological forms of life are different combinations of matter that facilitate, to one extent or another, consciousness expressing itself. So as the forms of life become more complex, for example, we get to mammals and primates, we find some rudimentary forms of empathy there. Hmm? When we get to the human form of life, it's more complex and facilitates this atma, this consciousness, the self, to contemplate itself that much more and to express itself. And we find in human life full opportunity to engage in voluntary acts of kindness, which is basically what, what, uh, what compassion is constituted of. Hmm? So, so to define compassion as a misfiring of the brain or a strategy of matter, you know, in the context of evolution, is to render the word, is to redefine the word altogether. Hmm? 
It's a voluntary act, an act of will and nature. Insentient matter has no will. Hmm? And if we conclude that we are matter, a physicalistic perspective, a materialistic from materialism as a philosophy perspective, hmm, then we have no will. Hmm? Without will, there's, there's no meaning to compassion. You cannot be a physicalist and, um, and have, a, have a role for compassion in life. Hmm? And to argue for compassion in the context of a materialistic perspective is to render the discussion absolutely meaningless from the start. Hmm? You follow me? Hmm? If you're just matter, just moving, hmm? no will, hmm? then rational discussion also has no meaning. It's just movements of molecules and atoms and so on and so forth. So, this is a very, it's a popular idea, but people don't play out the implications of it. It's a very unfortunate, you know, notion. Hmm? Now the myth of modern science is salvation through, well, through science. And you can go to robot heaven. They want, they want to turn, you can become a perfect robot. You can, you can recreate you and show you that you're a robot. I don't know if I want to go there. Hmm? and be a robot, which renders really <laughs> loving is, is, is over. There's no compassion there and so forth. So, hmm, we need, and this is the idea of the mystics, to turn inward onto the self. The self is a particle of consciousness, reservoir of consciousness, as we see in the form of a weight of mavishness, is really compassion personified. Hmm? Therefore, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, what did it say? He said, a serious spiritual culture. He, he said, the essence of Dharma, jive doi krishna nam sarva dharma sar. The essence of Dharma is to invoke in kirtan the divine name and jive doi, to show kindness to other living beings, to, be, to engage in compassion. So, it's part, this is really of the culture of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. As Bhakti notes, it's it's very spiritual practice, and the culture of compassion in the context of the, of the kirtan, of the holy name of Krishna, is such that it solves the moral problem. Again, I said it's impossible to be perfectly virtuous in the world. You step down here, it comes up over here, but to become a mystic and to dive deep within the self and and connect to the wellspring of compassion. You're not a problem for anybody. You're not an economic problem for anybody. You're self-satisfied. You're not a political problem for anybody. You're not taking from anybody. Therefore, you can find the yogis living in a cave. Hmm? So They've solved the how to behave with others because they see, as the Gita said, others as extensions of themselves. They see we are all units of consciousness. Hmm? So... The moral problem dilemma is solved, and then one standing on a ground from which real serious culture of bhakti rasa can take place. So you can enter, you can go. The moral law and dilemma is solved, and now you can enter into the land, the domain of love, something like that. So this is something about the, the how Advaita was. Uh, feeling what we should draw from his compassion. It's this aspect of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's descent. Again, there are two. There's the internal esoteric reasons. These are called the exoteric reasons. We should not dismiss the exoteric reasons, the external reasons for his descent. They pertain very much to us. That's why we heard earlier the middle section of his Lila, the Madhi Lila, is so important because in this stage hmm, he's showing the way. Hmm? We can't skip over that. And artificially, with a slight intellectual sleight of hand, uh, think that we've attained something more than we have because we can sp- say flowery words and speak about the ideal in an attractive way. We have to actually go there. Hmm? And therefore, spiritual life is about changing. It's not about staying how you are. It's very much about changing. Hmm? So this is... Uh, um, 
very beautiful on the part from a literary point of view, as I said earlier, of Krishnadas Kaviraj, who's now moved from the exoteric reason in brief in one verse to the to the esoteric from the esoteric to the exoteric reasons for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's descent. Hmm? And so he's feeling compassion. Seeing the condition of the world, he began to think seriously how all these people could be delivered from illusion. So he came up with an idea. We'll hear about that. Next. Sriman Madhveta Charja Ki Jai. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Jai. Sri Siddhaji Gopal Ki Jai. Any question? For a couple days, then back to London. Mm. Okay, good. Be sure to let us know if you need anything. Okay, go back to Bindavi, guys. Go to Prema Namdevi. 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 Go to